Is there a food that kind of makes you feel not so great after eating it, but you love it so much you just eat it anyway? Maybe it's too fatty or too salty or sweet or just too rich in general, but every time you come across it on the menu, you say, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, I'm getting them. Well, for me, that food is pancakes. Basically, after I eat a stack of pancakes, I'm useless for the rest of the day. Just lie me on the couch, turn on the TV, and come by every couple hours to make sure I'm still breathing. But today, I may have found a recipe that actually might work for me. It's from Cromwellian England, so mid-17th century, and it's a pancake with no butter and no lard. A pancake for absolution. That will make sense later, so just stick with me, this time on Tasting History. Today's recipe comes from the 1658 cookbook, The Complete Cook, expertly prescribing the most ready ways, whether Italian, Spanish, or French, for dressing of flesh and fish, ordering of sauces, or making of pastry. So I don't usually read the full title of these old cookbooks because as you can see, they tend to go on. But I love this one because how often do you read a title that has curly brackets in it? Anyway, to make fine pancakes fried without butter or lard. Take a pint of cream and six new laid eggs. Beat them very well together. Put in a quarter of a pound of sugar and one nutmeg or a little beaten mace, which you please, and so much flour as will thicken almost as much as ordinarily pancake batter. Your pan must be heated reasonably hot and wiped with a clean cloth. This done, put your batter as thick or thin as you please. All right, so yes, the recipe doesn't have butter or lard, but it does have six whole eggs and quite a bit of sugar, so I may still not uh, feel well after these. But you know what? That's my cross to bear, and I'm gonna soldier on. So for this recipe, you'll need one pint or 475 milliliters of cream, six eggs, one half cup or 113 grams of brown sugar, one whole nutmeg or two teaspoons of ground nutmeg, or one teaspoon of mace, and two cups or 240 grams of flour. Now, when it comes to the flour, the recipe gives you a lot of leeway because it doesn't tell you exactly how much flour to use, and it says that you can make it as thin or thick as you want. I like a fairly, fairly thick pancake, not like a crepe, so I went with two cups, but if you want something more like a crepe, just reduce it to maybe a cup and a half, and if you want it a little bit thicker, then just add some more flour. So first, it's a good practice to mix your eggs off to the side in a separate bowl, uh, before adding them to any of the other ingredients. You don't have to, you can just toss them on in, but sometimes you get shell and sometimes they don't mix right, so it's always good to mix beforehand. Then pour your cream into a large bowl, then add the six eggs and beat everything together until nice and smooth. So I whisked the cream and the eggs together for quite some time uh, because I wanted to get some air in there to give the, the pancakes some fluff. Now, modern pancakes usually have either baking powder or baking soda or something, or yeasted pancakes to, to give them a rise, but uh, these pancakes don't have anything like that, so the eggs, that's all you got to, to give it any fluff. Then pour in the sugar and whichever spice you're going to use, and beat those in as well. Finally, add in your flour and mix it nice and gently, just until there are no clumps. You don't want to overmix the flour because uh, it can become kind of chewy. So you can use all-purpose flour for this recipe. I would steer away from bread flour. It's gonna make the pancakes a little too chewy, I think. Uh, I ended up using whole wheat stone ground pastry flour from Bob's Red Mill. They make a really nice pastry flour that's perfect for a nice delicate pancake. Now that your batter is mixed, you can go ahead and leave it for about 20 to 30 minutes, um, either in the fridge or just out in the open with uh, something covering it. Um, and it'll give the flour some time to absorb all the liquid and just relax. And while the flour relaxes, you too can relax while I explain the history of pancakes. Pancakes are frankly difficult and not worth eating at all, unless they are of paper thinness and succulent tenderness. Vogue Magazine, 1935. Well, Vogue Magazine, when it comes to those cerulean blue military jackets by Yves Saint Laurent, you may know what you're talking about, but when it comes to breakfast foods, you're out of your league. Pancakes have been eaten all over the world for thousands of years and in every possible form, not just paper thin and tender. 
5,300 years ago, poor Utzi the Iceman enjoyed one last meal before being murdered and frozen for posterity in the Italian Alps. And what was old Itzi's last meal? That's right, a pancake. Kind of. See, scientists found einkorn and charcoal in his stomach and deduced that what he probably had was a primitive form of pancake. Granted, instead of sausage or bacon, Utzi opted for dried ibex meat, no longer available with the Rudy Tutti fresh and fruity breakfast, but you get the idea. Now, Utzi would not have had a sweet pancake like we have, or really anything that we would uh, associate with pancakes. For that, we have to go to ancient Rome. On the streets of ancient Rome, you could get alita dolcia, or another sweet. It was basically a pancake made with milk, flour, and egg, just like today. They even put some spice in it and drizzled it with honey, a precursor perhaps to our modern day maple syrup. Pancakes spring up in almost every culture around the world. Around the Horn of Africa, they have something called injera, which are huge pancakes, very thin, made of teff flour, and are used not only for eating, but as the actual plate itself, and often the utensil. And if you have an Ethiopian restaurant near you, I suggest going and, and having a meal because they will serve this injera, and it's just a really cool experience, so go. In Japan, they have a savory pancake called okonomiyaki that's made with flour, eggs, cabbage, and sometimes pork or even octopus, something you probably aren't going to find at IHOP. You can find pancakes made of rice called chatamari in Nepal, and in every part of India, they have some form of pancake. There's dosa made with fermented batter or pati shapta, which I've always wanted to try. They're stuffed with dates or coconut or a sweet thickened milk. I love that stuff. And speaking of stuffing pancakes, that's a thing everywhere too. Ashkenazi Jews fill blints with cheese and fruit, and in Hungary they have something called gundel palacinta, stuffed with walnuts and raisins and topped with chocolate sauce. And sometimes they even put rum in it to flambe it. And flambeing pancakes, well, that's a whole thing too. One of the most famous pancakes in the world, with quite the origin story, started with flambeing. Supposedly, it was in 1895 at the Café de Paris in Monte Carlo, when the future King Edward VII was dining with a lovely young woman named Suzette. Then, in the words of their 14-year-old assistant waiter, Henri Charpentier, it was quite by accident that the cordials caught fire. I thought I was ruined. The prince and his friends were waiting. How could I begin all over? I tasted it. It was the most delicious melody of sweet flavors I had ever tasted. The prince ate the pancakes. He asked me the name of that which he had eaten with so much relish. I told him it was to be called Crepe Princesse. Will you, said his majesty, change Crepe Princesse to Crepe Suzette? Thus was born and baptized this confection, one taste of which I really believe would reform a cannibal into a civilized gentleman. Who knew cannibalism was so rampant a problem in late 19th century Monaco? But while every culture has their own pancake, I mean, I have like a list of 50 I could have gone into, so I apologize if I skipped over your country, but we'd be here all day. But the actual name pancake comes from English around the 14th or 15th century, about the same time that we start seeing what would become the favored method of fundraising for the Boy Scouts and elementary schools all over. The Pancake Breakfast. Shrove Tuesday, a day to be shriven, or absolved. I told you we'd get back to this. Shrove Tuesday, or Fat Tuesday, or Mardi Gras, was the last day a medieval Englishman or Englishwoman could gorge themselves into oblivion before the 40 days of fasting called Lent. And what better way to gorge yourself than with a pancake breakfast? On the morning of Shrove Tuesday, the whole kingdom is quiet. But by that time that the clock strikes eleven, there is a bell rung, called the pancake bell. The sound whereof makes thousands of people distracted and forgetful of manners or of humanity. Then there is a thing called wheat and flour, which the sulfury necromantic cooks do mingle with water, eggs, spice, and other tragical magical enchantments. Then they put it by little and little into a frying pan of boiling suet where it makes a confused, dismal hissing, like the Lemian snakes in the reeds of Acheron sticks or Phlegaton. Until at last, by the skill of the cooks, it is transformed into the form of a pancake. 
which ominous incantation the ignorant people do devour very greedily. Now, John Taylor, who wrote that in 1620, did not actually believe that the pancakes were of the devil. It was written with a bit of tongue-in-cheek, um, kind of mocking the church at the time and, and uh, some other institutions, but I just, I love it. Anyway, after filling their bellies on a pancake breakfast, the town people somehow got up the energy to play games and sports, including one called mob football, which is exactly as it sounds. Then, stuffed and probably battered and bruised a bit, they would make their way to the church to ask for final forgiveness before the 40 days of Lent. Now, while the pancakes we're making today would have come out of this same tradition, I feel like the absence of suet and uh, magical enchantments, for that matter, kind of lifted up out of the muck in the mob football world and into the light, sophisticated pancake that we know today. The kind that takes me 24 hours from which to recover. And I can't wait to get back to them. So let's do it. So per that original recipe, you'll need a pan or a griddle wiped with a clean cloth and then put on the stove about medium heat until it's nice and hot. Once it's hot, rub some cold butter on it just to give it a nice coating and then dole out your first pancake. Now, depending on how thick or thin your batter ended up being, it's going to depend on how long you're going to leave it on the griddle, but really what you're looking for is for the top to uh, go from shiny to matte. And if there are any bubbles, for those bubbles to all have popped. Once that happens, flip it over, leave it on the griddle for about another minute, and then take it off and repeat ad nauseum. This recipe made me about a dozen pretty good sized pancakes. So if you want more, double it. And if you want less, who would want less pancakes? I does not compute. So here we are, our 17th century pancakes. They look gorgeous. They smell amazing. And you can really get that aroma of the, uh, of the mace coming through, which I'm excited to taste. Um, so how do we eat these? We can eat them plain, which was, which was often done. Now, you didn't get like a stack of pancakes. You just got a pancake or two pancakes and you ate them with your hands. Another way to eat them would be there are stories of putting honey on them or berries or nuts, um, even sugar or salt, oddly enough. Um, so I'm gonna try one plain, get the flavor of the pancake, and then I'm gonna try one with maybe some nuts and berries and honey. Um, do it all, why not? So here we go. Plain pancake, flat, warm, uh, let's see how it goes. Two little bites. Hmm. So the texture is a lot like a modern pancake, though maybe not like as fluffy, not as airy, but, but still very soft and tender. Really, really um, something you'd recognize. What you won't recognize is the flavor. And that's, that's due to the rather large amount of spice. You know, um, that's a lot of mace. It's not overpowering at all, but that's definitely the, the flavor that's coming through. And I think if you're going to eat them plain, they need to have something like that. You know, now we put maple syrup on it or, or boysenberry maybe. Uh, and so that's the flavor that kind of dominates and pancakes are just a kind of a vessel to your mouth. But this, the flavor needs to be a spice and, and that's what it is. And the sugar, it's nice and sweet, but not overpowering at all. Now let's try for something a little more overpowering. We're gonna put some berries and uh, honey and nuts on there. We'll give it a shot. Mmm. I took way too big a bite. <laughs> okay, so once you add all of the, all of the accoutrement uh, to the pancake, they really take over the flavor. You can still taste the, the mace, um, but the honey and the, and the berries especially kind of really take over. And I kind of like that. It's a little more complicated. Um, honestly, I might not do all three next time, the, the nuts, the berries, and the honey, maybe just honey to give it kind of a, a sweet golden flavor, whatever gold tastes like, uh, or, or just the berries. Um, maybe like a compote actually would be really nice anyway. Yeah, I love pancakes. They're just so good. They were good 400 years ago and they're still good today. They were probably good when uh, old Itzy was eating his einkorn pancake before he got murdered. 
Alright, so if you end up making your own pancakes, whether they be modern, or from the 16th or 17th century, or going back to the Roman times, please make sure to share pictures with me on Instagram and Twitter. I'll put my handles uh, down in the corner here or in the description. And I will see you next time on Tasting History. I'm going to eat these pancakes now. Thank you very much. <laughs>